The Story of Civilization, Volume 6, The Reformation, by Will Durant, Part 1, Continued, Cassette 10, Side 2. These men influenced Erasmus profoundly for his betterment. From a vain and flighty youth, drunk with the wine of the classics and the ambrosia of women, he was transformed into an earnest and painstaking scholar, anxious not merely for shillings and renown, but for some lasting and beneficent achievement. When he left England in January of 1500, he had formed his resolve to study and edit the Greek text of the New Testament as the distilled essence of that real Christianity which, in the judgment of reformers and humanists alike, had been overlaid and concealed by the dogmas and accretions of centuries. His pleasant memory of this first visit to England was darkened by the final hour. At Dover, passing through the customs, the money that his English friends had given him, amounting to some twenty pounds, or about two thousand dollars, was confiscated by the authorities, as the English law forbade the export of gold or silver. Moore, not yet a great lawyer, had mistakenly advised him that the prohibition applied only to English currency, and Erasmus had changed the pounds into French coins. Neither his stumbling English nor his prancing Latin availed to deflect the avid orthodoxy of the law, and Erasmus embarked for France practically penniless. I suffered shipwreck, he said, before I went to sea. 2. The Peripatetic Stationing himself for a few months in Paris, he published his first significant work, Collectania Adagiorum, a collection of 818 adages or quotations, mostly from classical authors. The revival of learning, that is, of ancient literature, had set a fashion of adorning one's opinions with a snatch from some Greek or Latin author. We see the custom in extreme form in Montaigne's Essays and Burton's Anatomy of Melancholy. It lingered into the eighteenth century in the forensic oratory of England. Erasmus accompanied each adage with a brief comment, usually pointed to current interest and salted with satiric wit. So, he observed, priests are said in Scripture to devour the sins of the people, and they find sins so hard to digest that they must have the best wine to wash them down. The book was a boon to writers and speakers. It sold so well that for a year Erasmus could feed himself unaided. Moreover, Archbishop Warham, relishing the book despite its barbs, sent the author a gift of money and offered him a benefice in England. Erasmus, however, was not prepared to abandon the continent for an island. In the next eight years he published several revisions of the Adagia, expanding it to 3,260 entries. Sixty editions appeared in his lifetime. Translations were issued from the original Latin into English, French, Italian, German, and Dutch. Altogether it was among the best-sellers of its time. Even so, the proceeds were meager, and food was not enough. Pinched for pounds, Erasmus wrote on December 12, 1500, to his friend James Batt, who was tutoring a son of the Lady Anne of Vere, asking him to point out to her how much more credit I shall do her by my learning than the other divines whom she maintains. They preach ordinary sermons. I write what will live forever. They, with their silly rubbish, are heard in one or two churches— my works will be read by all who know Latin and Greek in every country in the world. Such unlearned ecclesiastics abound everywhere. Men like me are scarcely found in many centuries. Repeat all this to her unless you are too superstitious to tell a few fibs for a friend. When this approach failed, he wrote again in January, suggesting that Bat tell the lady that Erasmus was losing his eyesight, and added, Send me four or five gold pieces of your own which you will recover out of the lady's money. As Bat did not enter this trap, Erasmus wrote directly to the lady, comparing her with the noblest heroines of history and the fairest concubines of Solomon, and predicting for her an eternity of fame. To this ultimate vanity she succumbed. Erasmus received a substantial gift and recovered his eyesight. The custom of the time forgave a writer for begging aid from patrons, since publishers were not yet equipped to sustain even widely read authors. Erasmus could have had benefices, episcopacies, even later a cardinal's hat. He refused such offers time and again in order to remain a free lance, intellectually fetterless. He preferred to beg in freedom rather than decay in bonds. In 1502, fleeing plague, Erasmus moved to Louvain. Adrian of Utrecht, head of the university, offered him a professorship. Erasmus declined. Returning to Paris, he settled down to earn his living by his pen, one of the earliest modern attempts at that reckless enterprise. He translated Cicero's offices, Euripides' Hecuba, and Lucian's Dialogues. Doubtless this jolly skeptic shared in forming Erasmus's mind and style. In 1504 Erasmus wrote to a friend, 
Good heavens, with what humor, with what rapidity does Lucian deal his blows, turning everything to ridicule and letting nothing pass without a touch of mockery. His hardest strokes are aimed at the philosophers, on account of their supernatural assumptions, and at the Stoics for their intolerable arrogance. He uses no less liberty in deriding the gods, whence the surname of Atheist was bestowed upon him, an honorable distinction coming from the impious and superstitious. On a second visit to England, in 1505 and 1506, he joined Collet in a pilgrimage to the shrine of St. Thomas a Becket at Canterbury. Describing this trip under fictitious names in one of his colloquies, he told how Gratian, or Collet, offended their monastic guide by suggesting that some of the wealth that adorned the cathedral might be used to alleviate poverty in Canterbury, how the monk showed them milk that had really come from the virgin's breast, and an amazing quantity of bones, all of which had to be kissed reverently, how Gratian balked at kissing an old shoe that Becket was said to have worn, and how, as a climactic favor and a sacred souvenir, the guide offered Gratian a cloth allegedly used by the saint to wipe his brow and blow his nose, and still showing evidences thereof, whereat Gratian grimaced and rebelled. The two humanists, mourning for humanity, returned to London. Good fortune came to Erasmus there. Henry the Seventh's physician was sending two sons to Italy. Erasmus was engaged to accompany them as general guide and supervisor. He stayed with the lads at Bologna for a year, devouring the libraries and adding daily to his fame for learning, latinity, and wit. Till this time he had worn the garb of an Augustinian canon, black robe, mantle, and cowl, with a white hood usually carried on the arm. Now, in 1506, he discarded these for the less conspicuous dress of a secular priest, and claimed to have received permission for this change from Pope Julius II, then in Bologna as a military conqueror. For reasons unknown to us, he returned to England in 1506 and lectured on Greek at Cambridge. But in 1508 we find him again in Italy, preparing an enlarged edition of his Adagia for the press of Aldus Minucius in Venice. Passing on to Rome in 1509, he was charmed by the easy life, fine manners, and intellectual cultivation of the cardinals. He was amused, as Luther in Rome the year before had been shocked, by the inroads that pagan themes and ways had made in the capital of Christendom. What offended Erasmus more was the martial policy, ardor, and pursuits of Julius II. There he agreed with Luther. But he agreed also with the cardinals, who warmly approved the frequent absences of the pugnacious pope. They welcomed Erasmus to their social gatherings and offered him some ecclesiastical sinecure if he would settle in Rome. Just as he was learning to love the Eternal City, Mountjoy sent him word that Henry the Seventh had died, that the friend of the humanists had become Henry the Eighth, and that all doors and preferments would now be open to Erasmus if he would come back to England. And along with Mountjoy's letter came one from Henry the Eighth himself. Our acquaintance began when I was a boy. The regard which I then learned to feel for you has been increased by the honorable mention you have made of me in your writings, and by the use to which you have applied your talents in the advancement of Christian truth. So far you have borne your burden alone. Give me now the pleasure of assisting and protecting you so far as my power extends. Your welfare is precious to us all. I propose, therefore, that you abandon all thought of settling elsewhere. Come to England, and assure yourself of a hearty welcome. You shall name your own terms. They shall be as liberal and honorable as you please. I recollect that you once said that when you were tired of wandering you would make this country the home of your old age. I beseech you, by all that is holy and good, to carry out this promise of yours. We have not now to learn the value of either your acquirements or your advice. We shall regard your presence among us as the most precious possession that we have. You require your leisure for yourself. We shall ask nothing of you save to make our realm your home. Come to me, therefore, my dear Erasmus, and let your presence be your answer to my invitation. How could so courteous and generous an invitation be refused? Even if Rome made him a cardinal, Erasmus's tongue would be tied. In England, surrounded by influential friends and protected by a powerful king, he might write more freely and yet be safe. Half-reluctantly he bade farewell to the humanists of Rome, and to the great palaces and libraries, to the cardinals who had favored him. He made his way again over the Alps, and to Paris, and to England. 3. The Satirist He stayed there five years, and in all that time he received from the king nothing more than an occasional salutation. Was Henry too busy with foreign relations or domestic relatives? Erasmus waited and fretted. Mountjoy came to the rescue with a gift. Warham dowered him with the revenues of a parish in Kent. 
and John Fisher, Bishop of Rochester and Chancellor of Cambridge University, appointed him Professor of Greek at thirteen pounds, or about thirteen hundred dollars, a year. To raise this income to the maintenance of a servant and a horse, Erasmus dedicated his publications to his friends, who responded ever inadequately. In the first year of this third sojourn in England, and in the home of Thomas More, Erasmus wrote in seven days his most famous book, The Praise of Folly. Its Latinized Greek title, Encomium Morii, was a pun on More's name, but Moros was Greek for fool and Moria for folly. Erasmus kept the work in manuscript for two years, then went briefly to Paris to have it printed in 1511. Forty editions were published in his lifetime. There were a dozen translations. Rabelais devoured it. As late as 1632, Milton found it in everyone's hand at Cambridge. Moria in Erasmus's use meant not only folly, absurdity, ignorance, and stupidity, but impulse, instinct, emotion, and unlettered simplicity, as against wisdom, reason, calculation, intellect. The whole human race, we are reminded, owes its existence to folly, for what is so absurd as the male's polymorphous pursuit of the female, his feverish idealization of her flesh, his goatish passion for copulation? What man in his senses would pay for such detumescence with the lifelong bondage of monogamy? What woman in her senses would pay for it with the pains and tribulations of motherhood? Is it not ridiculous that humanity should be the accidental by-product of this mutual attrition? If men and women paused to reason, all would be lost. This illustrates the necessity of folly and the foolishness of wisdom. Would bravery exist if reason ruled? Would happiness be possible? Or was Ecclesiastes right in believing that he that increaseth knowledge increaseth sorrow, and in much wisdom is much grief? Who would be happy if he knew the future? Fortunately, science and philosophy are failures, are ignored by the people, and do no great damage to the vital ignorance of the race. The astronomers will give you to a hair's breadth the dimensions of the moon, sun, and stars as easily as they would do that of a flagon or a pipkin, but nature laughs at their puny conjectures. The philosophers confound the confused and darken the obscure. They lavish time and wit upon logical and metaphysical subtleties with no result but wind. We should send them rather than our soldiers against the Turks, who would retreat in terror before such bewildering verbosity. The physicians are no better. Their whole art is now practiced as one incorporated compound of imposture and craft. As for the theologians, they will tell you to a tittle all the successive proceedings of omnipotence in the creation of the universe. They will explain the precise manner of original sin being derived from our first parents. They will satisfy you as to how our Savior was conceived in the virgin's womb, and will demonstrate in the consecrated wafer how accidents may subsist without a subject, how one body can be in several places at the same time, and how Christ's body in heaven differs from his body on the cross or in the sacrament. Think also of the nonsense pervade as miracles and prodigies, apparitions, curative shrines, evocations of Satan, and such like bugbears of superstition. These absurdities are good trade and procure a comfortable income to such priests and friars as by this craft get their gain. What shall I say of such as cry up and maintain the cheat of pardons and indulgences? that by these compute the time of each soul's residence in purgatory, and assign them a longer or shorter continuance according as they purchase more or fewer of these paltry pardons and saleable exemptions? Or what can be said bad enough of others who pretend that by the force of such magical charms, or by the fumbling over their beads in the rehearsal of such and such petitions, which some religious impostors invented either for diversion or what is more likely for advantage, they shall procure riches, honors, pleasure, long life, and lusty old age, nay, after death, a seat at the right hand of the Saviour. The satire runs on at the expense of monks, friars, inquisitors, cardinals, popes. Monks pester the people with begging and think to take heaven by a siege of soporific psalmodies. The secular clergy hunger and thirst after money. They are most subtle in the craft of getting tithes, offerings, perquisites, etc. All ranks and varieties of the clergy agree in putting witches to death. The popes have lost any resemblance to the apostles in their riches, honors, jurisdictions, offices, dispensations, licenses, indulgences, ceremonies and tithes, excommunications and interdicts, their lust for legacies, their worldly diplomacy and bloody wars. How could such a church survive except through the folly, the gullible simplicity of mankind? The praise of folly stirred the theologians to an understandable fury. 
You should know, wrote Martin Dropsius to Erasmus, that your Moria has excited a great disturbance even among those who were formerly your most devoted admirers. But the satire in this gay devastation was mild compared to that which marked Erasmus's next outburst. The third and final year of his teaching at Cambridge in 1513 was the year of Pope Julius II's death. In 1514 there appeared in Paris a skit or dialogue called Julius Exclusus. Erasmus made every effort, short of explicit denial, to conceal his authorship, but the manuscript had circulated among friends and more unguardedly listed it among Erasmus's works. It may stand here as perhaps an extreme example of Erasmus the satirist. The dead warrior pope finds the gates of heaven closed against him by an obstinate St. Peter. Julius, enough of this. I am Julius the Ligurian. P.M. Peter, P.M.? What is that? Pestis Maxima? Julius, Pontifex Maximus, you rascal. Peter, if you are three times Maximus, you can't get in here unless you're Optimus also. Julius, impertinence. You, who have been no more than Sanctus all these ages, and I, Sanctissimus, Sanctissimus Dominus, Sanctitas, holiness itself, with bulls to show it. Peter, is there no difference between being holy and being called holy? Let me look a little closer. Hmm, signs of impiety aplenty. Priests cassock, but bloody armor beneath it. Eyes savage, mouth insolent, forehead brazen, body scarred with sins all over breath loaded with wine, health broken with debauchery. I threaten as you will. I will tell you what you are. You are Julius the Emperor, come back from hell. Julius, oh, make an end or I will excommunicate you. Peter, excommunicate me? By what right I would know? Julius, the best of rights. You are only a priest, perhaps not that. You cannot consecrate. Open, I say. Peter, you must show your merits first. Julius, what do you mean by merits? Peter, have you taught true doctrine? Julius, not I. I've been too busy fighting. There are monks to look after doctrine, if that is of any consequence. Peter, have you gained souls to Christ by pure example? Julius, I have sent a good many to Tartarus. Peter, have you worked any miracles? Julius, pshaw, miracles are out of date. Peter, have you been diligent in your prayers? Julius. The invincible Julius ought not to answer a beggarly fisherman. However, you shall know who and what I am. First, I am a Ligurian, and not a Jew like you. My mother was a sister of the great Pope Sixtus IV. The Pope made me a rich man out of church property. I became a cardinal. I had my misfortunes. I had the French pox. I was banished, hunted out of my country, but I knew all along that I should come to be Pope. It came true, partly with French help, partly with money which I borrowed at interest, partly with promises. Croesus could not have produced all the money that was wanted. The bankers will tell you about that, but I succeeded, and I have done more for the church in Christ than any pope before me. Peter, what did you do? Julius, I raised the revenue. I invented new offices and sold them. I recoined the currency and made a great sum that way. Nothing can be done without money. Then I annexed Bologna to the Holy See— I set all the princes of Europe by the years. I tore up treaties and kept great armies in the field. I covered Rome with palaces and left five millions in the treasury behind me. Peter, why did you take Bologna? Julius, because I wanted the revenue. Peter, and how about Ferrara? Julius, the duke was an ungrateful wretch. He accused me of simony, called me a pederast. I wanted the duchy of Ferrara for a son of my own, who could be depended upon to be true to the church, and who had just ponyarded the Cardinal of Pavia. Peter. What? Popes with wives and children? Julius. Wives? No, not wives, but why not children? Peter. Were you guilty of the crimes of which they accused you? Julius. That is nothing to the purpose. Peter. Is there no way of removing a wicked Pope? Julius. Absurd! Who can remove the highest authority of all? A pope can be corrected only by a general council, but no general council can be held without the pope's consent. Thus he cannot be deposed for any crime whatsoever. Peter, not for murder? Julius, no, not even if it were parricide. Peter, not for fornication? Julius, oh, not for incest. Peter, not for simony? Julius, not for six hundred acts of simony. 
Peter, not for poisoning? Julius, no, nor for sacrilege. Peter, not for all these crimes gathered in a single person? Julius, add six hundred more to them. There's no power that can depose the Pope. Peter, a novel privilege for my successors to be the wickedest of men yet be safe from punishment. So much the unhappier the church that cannot shake such a monster off its shoulders. The people ought to rise with paving stones and dash such a wretch's brains out. If Satan needed a vicar, he could find none fitter than you. What sign have you ever shown of an apostle? Julius, is it not apostolic to increase Christ's church? Peter, how have you increased the church? Julius, I filled Rome with palaces, troops of servants, armies, offices. Peter, the church had nothing of this when it was founded by Christ. Julius, oh, you're thinking of the old affair when you starved as a pope with a handful of poor hunted bishops about you. Time has changed all that. Look now at our gorgeous churches, bishops like kings, cardinals gloriously attended, horses and mules checked with gold and jewels and shod with gold and silver. Beyond all, myself, supreme pontiff, borne on soldiers' shoulders in a golden chair and waving my hand majestically to adoring crowds. Hearken to the roar of the cannon, the bugle notes, the boom of the drums. Observe the military engines, the shouting populace, torches blazing in street and square, and the kings of the earth scarce admitted to kiss my holiness's foot. Look at all this and tell me, is it not magnificent? You perceive what a poor wretch of a bishop you are compared to me. Peter, insolent wretch, fraud, usury, and cunning made you pope. I brought heathen Rome to acknowledge Christ. You have made it heathen again. Paul did not talk of the cities he had stormed, the legions he had slaughtered. He talked of shipwrecks, bonds, disgraces, stripes. These were his apostolic triumphs. These were the glories of a Christian general. When he boasted, it was of the souls he had recovered from Satan, not of his piles of ducats. Julius, all this is news to me. Peter, very likely. With your treaties and your protocols, your armies and your victories, you had no time to read the Gospels. You pretend to be a Christian, you're no better than a Turk. You think like a Turk, you are as licentious as a Turk. If there's any difference, you are worse. Julius, then you won't open the gates? Peter, sooner to anyone else than to such as you. Julius, if you don't give in, I'll take your place by storm. They're making fine havoc below just now. I shall soon have sixty thousand ghosts behind me. Peter, O oh, wretched man, O oh, miserable church! I'm not surprised that so few now apply here for admission when the church has such rulers. Yet there must be good in the world, too, when such a sink of iniquity can be honored merely because he bears the name of Pope. This, of course, is outrageously one-sided. No such unredeemed rascal as was here represented could have freed Italy from her invaders, replaced the old St. Peter's with the new, discovered, directed, and developed Michelangelo and Raphael, united Christian and classic civilization in the stanze of the Vatican, and offered to Raphael's skill that visage of profound thought and exhausted care pictured in the incomparable portrait of Julius in the Uffizi Gallery. And poor Erasmus calling all priests to apostolic poverty while himself importuning his friends for coin that a priest should pen so savage an indictment of a pope reveals the rebellious mood of the time. In 1518, year two of Luther, Peter Gillis wrote to Erasmus from Antwerp, The Julius Exclusus is for sale everywhere here. Everyone is buying it. Everyone is talking of it. No wonder the reformers later reproached Erasmus for having sounded the toxin of revolt and then himself fled. In 1514, another product of Erasmus's pen startled the intellectual world of Western Europe. From 1497 onward he had composed informal dialogues, professedly to teach Latin style and conversation, but incidentally discussing a rich variety of lively topics guaranteed to rouse schoolboys from their daily slumbers. His friend Beatus Renanus, with his permission, published a series of these as Familiarium Colloquiorum Formulae, Forms of Familiar Conversations, by Erasmus of Rotterdam, useful not only for polishing a boy's speech but for building his character. Later editions added more colloquies so that they became Erasmus's most substantial composition. They are a strange concoction, serious discussions of marriage and morals, exhortations to piety, exposés of absurdities and abuses in human conduct and belief, with a sprinkling of pungent or risque jokes. 
all in a chatty and idiomatic Latin which must have been harder to write than the formal language of learned discourse. An English translator in 1724 judged no book fitter to read which does in so delightful and instructing a manner utterly overthrow almost all the popish opinions and superstitions. This slightly overstates the point, but certainly Erasmus, in his gay way, used his textbook of Latin style to attack again the shortcomings of the clergy. He condemned relic-mongering, the misuse of excommunication, the acquisitiveness of prelates and priests, the false miracles foisted upon the credulous, the cult of saints for worldly ends, the excesses of fasting, the shocking contrasts between the Christianity of the Church and the Christianity of Christ. He made a prostitute praise monks as her most faithful clients. He warned a young lady who wished to keep her virginity that she should avoid those brawny, swill-bellied monks. Chastity is more endangered in the cloister than out of it. He deplored the exaltation of virginity and sang a paean to married love as superior to celibacy. He mourned that men so carefully mated good horses with good, but in marriages of financial convenience wed healthy maids to sickly men, and he proposed to forbid marriage to syphilitics or persons with any other serious disability or disease. Mingled with these sober reflections were passages of broad humor. Boys were advised to salute people when they sneezed, but not when they broke wind backward. And a pregnant woman was hailed with a unique blessing. Heaven grant that this burden that you carry may have as easy an exit as it had an entrance. Circumcision was recommended, for it moderates the itch of coition. A long dialogue between the young man and the harlot ended reassuringly with the lady's reform. Critics complained that these colloquies were a very reckless way of teaching Latin style. One alleged that all the youth of Freiburg were being corrupted by them. Charles V made their use in school a crime punishable with death. Luther here agreed with the emperor. On my deathbed I shall forbid my sons to read Erasmus's colloquies. The Fuhrer assured the book's success. Twenty-four thousand copies were sold soon after publication. Till 1550 only the Bible outsold it. Meanwhile, Erasmus had almost made the Bible his own. 4. The Scholar He left England in July 1514 and made his way through fog and customs to Calais. There he received from the prior of his forgotten monastery at Stain a letter suggesting that his leave of absence had long since expired, and that he had better return to spend his remaining years in repentant piety. He was alarmed, for in canon law the prior might call upon secular power to drag him back to his cell. Erasmus excused himself, and the prior did not press the matter, but to avoid a recurrence of the embarrassment, the wandering scholar asked his influential English friends to secure for him, from Leo X, a dispensation from his obligations as a monk. While these negotiations were proceeding, Erasmus made his way up the Rhine to Basel, and offered to Froben the printer the manuscript of his most important production, a critical revision of the Greek text of the New Testament, with a new Latin translation and a commentary. It was a labor of love, pride, and risk for author and publisher alike. The preparation had taken years, the printing and editing would be laborious and expensive, the presumption to improve upon Jerome's Latin version, long sanctified as the Vulgate, might be condemned by the Church, and the sales would probably fail to meet the costs. Erasmus reduced one hazard by dedicating the work to Leo X. In February 1516, Froben at last brought out Novum Instrumentum Omne, Diligentur ab Erasmo Rotterdamus, Recognitum et Emendatum. A later edition, of 1518, changed Instrumentum to Testamentum. In parallel columns, Erasmus presented the Greek text as revised by him, and his Latin translation. His knowledge of Greek was imperfect, and he shared with the typesetters the responsibility for many errors. From the standpoint of scholarship, this first edition of the Greek New Testament to be published in print was inferior to that which a corps of scholars had completed and printed for Cardinal Jimenez in 1514, but which was not given to the public till 1522. These two works mark the application of humanistic learning to the early literature of Christianity, and the beginning of that biblical criticism which in the 19th century restored the Bible to human authorship and fallibility. Erasmus's notes were published in a separate volume. They were written in clear and idiomatic Latin, intelligible to all college graduates at the time, and were widely read. Though generally orthodox, they anticipated many findings of later research. In his first edition he omitted the famous Coma Johannium, 1 John chapter 5, verse 7, which affirmed the Trinity but is rejected by the standard revised version today as a fourth-century interpolation. 
He printed, but marked as probably spurious, the story of the woman taken in adultery, John chapter 7, verse 53, and chapter 8, verse 11, and the last twelve verses of the Gospel of Mark. He repeatedly signalized the difference between primitive and current Christianity. So on Matthew chapter 23, verse 27, he commented, What would Jerome say could he see the virgin's milk exhibited for money, with as much honor paid to it as to the consecrated body of Christ? the miraculous oils, the portions of the true cross, enough if collected to freight a large ship. Here we have the hood of St. Francis, there our lady's petticoat, or St. Anne's comb, not presented as innocent aids to religion, but as the substance of religion itself, and all through the avarice of priests and the hypocrisy of monks playing upon the credulity of the people. Noting that Matthew, chapter 19, verse 12, some have made themselves eunuchs for the kingdom of heaven's sake, was alleged to counsel monastic celibacy, Erasmus wrote, In this class we include those who by fraud or intimidation have been thrust into that life of celibacy, where they were allowed to fornicate but not to marry, so that if they openly keep a concubine they are Christian priests, but if they take a wife they are burned. In my opinion, parents who intend their children for celibate priesthood would be much kinder to castrate them in infancy, rather than to expose them whole against their will to this temptation to lust. And on 1 Timothy, chapter 3, verse 2, There are priests now in vast numbers, enormous herds of them, seculars and regulars, and it is notorious that very few of them are chaste. The great proportion fall into lust and incest and open profligacy. It would surely be better if those who cannot be continent should be allowed lawful wives of their own, and so escape this foul and miserable pollution. Finally, in a note on Matthew, chapter 11, verse 30, Erasmus sounded the basic note of the Reformers, the return from the church to Christ. Truly the yoke of Christ would be sweet, and his burden light, if petty human institutions added nothing to what he himself imposed. He commanded us nothing save love for one another, and there is nothing so bitter that affection does not soften and sweeten it. Everything according to nature is easily born, and nothing accords better with the nature of man than the philosophy of Christ, of which the sole end is to give back to fallen nature its innocence and integrity. The Church added to it many things, of which some can be omitted without prejudice to the faith, as, for example, all those philosophic doctrines on the nature of and the distinction of persons in the deity. What rules, what superstitions we have about vestments! How many fasts are instituted! What shall we say about bows, about the authority of the Pope, the abuse of absolutions and dispensations? Would that men were content to let Christ rule by the laws of the gospel, and that they would no longer seek to strengthen their obscure and tyranny by human decrees. It was probably the notes that carried the book to a success that must have surprised author and publisher alike. The first edition was disposed of in three years. New and revised editions were issued in sixty-nine printings before Erasmus died. Criticism of the work was vehement. Many errors were pointed out, and Dr. Johann Eck, professor at Ingolstadt and proto-antagonist of Luther, branded as scandalous Erasmus's statement that the Greek of the New Testament was inferior to that of Demosthenes. Leo X, however, approved the work, and Pope Adrian VI asked Erasmus to do for the Old Testament what he had done for the New. But the Council of Trent condemned Erasmus's translation and pronounced Jerome's Vulgate the only authentic Latin version of the Bible. Erasmus's New Testament was soon superseded as scholarship, but as an event in the history of thought, its influence was immense. It facilitated and welcomed the vernacular translations that were soon to follow. Said a fervent passage in the preface, I would have the weakest woman read the Gospels and the Epistles of St. Paul. I would have those words translated into all languages, so that not only Scots and Irishmen, but Turks and Saracens might read them. I long for the ploughboy to sing them to himself as he follows the plough, the weaver to hum them to the tune of his shuttle, the traveller to beguile with them the dullness of his journey. Other studies we may regret having undertaken, but happy is the man upon whom death comes when he is engaged in these. These sacred words give you the very image of Christ speaking, healing, dying, rising again, and making him so present that were he before your very eyes you would not more truly see him. Rejoicing in the competence of Froben's press and staff, Erasmus issued in November 1516 a critical edition of Jerome, and followed it with similarly revised classical and patristic texts, correcting four thousand errors in the received text of Seneca. These were substantial services to scholarship. He retold the story of the New Testament in paraphrases in 1517. Such tasks required frequent stays in Basel, but a new attachment fixed his residence near the royal court at Brussels. 
Charles was at this time only King of Castile and ruler of the Netherlands, not yet Emperor Charles V. He was only fifteen, but his keen mind already ranged over diverse interests, and he was readily persuaded that his court might enhance its luster if he included the outstanding writer of the age among his privy counsellors. It was so ordered, and on returning from Basel in 1516 Erasmus accepted the honorary position at a modest salary. He was offered a canonry at Courtrai with the promise of a bishopric. He refused it, remarking to a friend, "'There's a dream to amuse you.' He received and rejected invitations to teach at the universities of Leipzig and Ingolstadt. Francis I tried to detach him from Charles with a flattering request that he join the court of France. Erasmus said no with flowered courtesy. Meanwhile, Leo X had sent to London the solicited dispensations. In March 1517, Erasmus crossed to London and received the papal letters freeing him from his monastic obligations and the disabilities of bastardy. To the formal documents, Leo added a personal note. Beloved son, health and apostolic benediction, the good favor of your life and character, your rare erudition and high merits, witnessed not only by the monuments of your studies, which are everywhere celebrated, but also by the general vote of the most learned men, and commended to us finally by the letters of two most illustrious princes, the King of England and the Catholic King of France, give us reason to distinguish you with special and singular favor. We have therefore willingly granted your request, being ready to declare more abundantly our affection for you when you shall either yourself minister occasion, or accident shall furnish it, deeming it right that your holy industry, assiduously exerted for the public advantage, should be encouraged to higher endeavors by adequate rewards. Perhaps it was a judicious bribe to good behavior, perhaps an honest gesture from a tolerant and humanist court. In any case, Erasmus never forgot this papal courtesy, and would always find it hard to break from a church that had so patiently borne the sting of his critique. 5. The Philosopher Returning to Brussels, he found himself further seduced to caution by cordial welcome at the royal court. He took his privy councillorship seriously, forgetting that brilliant authors are rarely equipped for statesmanship. In the busy year 1516, he composed in haste an Institutio Principis Christiani, Education of a Christian Prince, rich in pre-Machiavellian platitudes of how a king should behave. In the dedication to Charles, he wrote with bold directness, You owe it to Providence that your realm has been acquired without injury to any. Your wisdom will be best shown if you keep it in peace and tranquility. Like most philosophers, Erasmus reckoned monarchy the least evil form of government. He feared the people as a fickle, many-headed monster, deprecated the popular discussion of laws and politics, and judged the chaos of revolution worse than the tyranny of kings but he counseled his Christian prince to guard against the concentration of wealth. Taxes should fall only upon luxuries. There should be fewer monasteries, more schools. Above all, there should be no war among Christian states, not even against the Turks. We shall better overcome the Turks by the piety of our lives than by arms. The empire of Christianity will thus be defended by the same means by which it was originally established. What does war beget except war? But civility invites civility, justice invites justice. As Charles and Francis edged toward hostilities, Erasmus made appeal after appeal for peace. He complimented the French king on a passing mood of conciliation, and asked how anyone could think of waging war with France, the purest and most flourishing part of Christendom. In Querella Pacis, the complaint of peace, in 1517, he reached his peak of passionate eloquence. I pass silently over the tragedies of ancient wars. I will stress only those which have taken place in the course of these last years. Where is the land or sea where people have not fought in the most cruel manner? Where is the river that has not been dyed with human blood, with Christian blood? O oh, supreme shame! They behave more cruelly in battle than non-Christians, more savagely than wild beasts. All these wars were undertaken as the caprice of princes, to the great detriment of the people whom these conflicts in no way concerned. Bishops, cardinals, popes who are vicars of Christ, none among them is ashamed to start the war that Jesus so execrated." What is there in common between the helmet and the mitre? Bishops, how dare you, who hold the place of the apostles, teach people things that touch on war at the same time that you teach the precepts of the apostles? There is no peace, even unjust, which is not preferable to the most just of wars. Princes and generals may profit from war, but the masses bear the tragedies and the costs. It may sometimes be necessary to fight a war of self-defense, but even in such cases it may be wiser to buy off the enemy than to wage war. Let the kings submit their disputes to the Pope. This would have been impractical under Julius II, himself a warrior, 
but Leo X, the learned, honest, and pious pontiff, might arbitrate with justice and preside effectively over an international court. Erasmus called nationalism a curse to humanity and challenged statesmen to forge a universal state. I wish, he said, to be called a citizen of the world. He forgave Boudet for loving France, but in my opinion it is more philosophical to put our relations with things and men on such a footing as to treat the world as the common country of us all. Erasmus was the least national spirit in the rising nationalism of the Reformation age. The most sublime thing, he wrote, is to deserve well of the human race. We must not look to Erasmus for any realistic conception of human nature, or the causes of war, or of the behavior of states. He never faced the problem that Machiavelli was dealing with in those same years, whether a state can survive if it practices the morality that it preaches to its citizens. The function of Erasmus was to cut dead branches from the tree of life rather than to construct a positive and consistent philosophy. He was not even sure that he was a Christian. He frequently professed to accept the Apostles' Creed, yet he must have doubted hell, for he wrote that they are not as impious who deny the existence of God as are those who picture him as inexorable. He could hardly have believed in the divine authorship of the Old Testament, for he averred his willingness to see the whole Old Testament abolished, if that would quiet the furor raised over Rutlin. He smiled at the traditions that Minos and Numa persuaded their peoples to obey uncongenial legislation by fathering it upon the gods, and probably suspected Moses of similar statesmanship. He expressed surprise that Moore was satisfied with the arguments for personal immortality. He thought of the Eucharist as a symbol rather than a miracle. He obviously doubted the Trinity, the Incarnation, and the Virgin Birth. And Moore had to defend him from a correspondent who declared that Erasmus had privately confessed his unbelief. He called in question one after another of the Christian usages of his time. This book is continued on Cassette 11, Side 1.